that don't know me, I'm Angela Maddy, and I have the honor and the privilege of teaching healthcare management students. And I can't say it too loudly, but it never feels like a job to me because the dean's in the back. But I love what I do. And today we're talking about careers um, in healthcare management, an ever growing field. Today's program was sponsored by our American College of Healthcare Executive Student Club the MBA in Healthcare Management with support from Gina Frank and the Graduate Career Office. And before we get started, we have two deans. We call them O'Connor Squared in the back. <laughs> dean Matt O'Connor and Dean Ed O'Connor, um, which is, yeah. They're very supportive. And they essentially represent what we need to do in healthcare. Dean O'Connor trains our healthcare force and, and Matt has a background in finance, and we really need a marriage between the business side and the healthcare workforce side to really make a difference. So I appreciate their support in being here today. <coughs> Before we get started, if you will allow me, this is a, just a terrific group of people, and they deserve the credit. Um, they were responsible for tonight's program, and they really are passionate and enthusiastic about pursuing a career in healthcare management, of which our speakers will focus on. So, Larry, can you stand up? Larry's our chapter president. He's actually retired from the program, but I keep on looking him back. Austin, poor Austin, I, I tell him he has potential, so I. Austin used to pick on us. He's yeah. actually interning with Jim this semester. Oh, yeah. Melissa, <laughs> is Melissa here today? She's a little busy doing two degrees teaching and working full time with a three year old. David, is David here? Shiva, I know Shiva's here. Shiva, could you stand up, please? I saw Stan. Is Larry here today, Stan? He's not going to all right, well, Stan, you stand up for Larry. This is Stan Patrick's <laughs> in here. Really Martina, who is a lawyer. <laughs> Matt, where's Matt? Matt's one of our youngest who really pitched in. <laughs> Anthony, is Anthony here? No. Shannon, I know, is here because she was giving me orders, the Italian orders. <laughs> Neuropalm. I know Sarah. Wait, lady. Can you stand up? And Kristen. In the back here. And the program today is really for these young men and women who've decided that healthcare is where they want to be. And, and it's a good thing because we now have a gross domestic product that is allocated to healthcare in the tune of 17.3%. And you would think we would get some bang for that dollar since we are the highest spending nation possible. That's the United States over there in the yellow. But we know on every possible level, and Dr. Galvin, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Life expectancy, infant mortality, we are awful in terms of outcomes. So we're not getting value for the healthcare dollar. On top of that, if you check into a hospital, you have a risk of death, and my students are laughing because I love this slide, but I do. Mm -hmm. That is one in 200. It's safer to get on an airplane than it is to go into a hospital in this country. Never has it been more exciting, and I, I was kidding Jim because when the dinosaurs rocked the planet, Jim was my healthcare graduate finance teacher. And at that time, we were trained by a guy called John Tom Thompson who instituted DRGs, which was the biggest thing to happen in healthcare. But now, we have a healthcare reform bill that someone told me weighs 55 pounds. It's over 2,000 pages. And within that health care reform bill, we have 100 plus the secretary shall. And that means that the secretary shall figure out how to implement this and write regulations. So in terms of being in this field, it's, it's never a more exciting, more challenging field than we have right now. So 
and we have three of the top experts in the field right now to tell us why you should continue to pursue your passion. This is one artist's depiction of the health care reform bill implemented. Oh my god. <laughs> So they say it's a little bit busy. A little bit busy. <laughs> a little bit busy, but why we need good people in healthcare reform. So we will have my student colleagues will introduce each of our speakers in detail, but I just want to personally thank on behalf of Quinnipiac our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Galvin, who just took time from a very busy schedule this week. I mean if any of you have been following, Tuesday was a little busy in Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> I just asked him if he knows who he's working for. <laughs> <laughs> he's waiting for the chance to come out. I just told him some, some Irish guy. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. That's true. Jim Cullen, who's the president and CEO of Gaylord Hospital, and who's graciously mentoring and doing a wonderful job mentoring Austin this year, and someone who never says no to our invitations, who's been extremely supportive to our program, Nancy Rosenthal, who is a senior VP at Greenwich Hospital and a VP at the Yale Health System. So if you will welcome our panelists, and I'm going to call Larry, who will come up and officially introduce Dr. Galvin. So thank you. Thank you all. Uh, hi. So as you already heard, uh, Dr. Galvin is the commissioner for the Department of Public Health. He's been the commissioner since the end of 2003. Uh, before that, he was a physician uh, since 1965, and he got his med medical degree in Tufts University in 1964. Uh, he also went to the, the Army War College in 1986, and when he was in the U.S. Army, he acquired the rank of Brigadier General. Um, also, if, you, if that's not enough education, he decided to go get his, MP, uh, his, um, his Master's in Public Health from UConn back in 1996, and then decided to go back to UConn to get his MBA in 2007. Uh, there's more information, a little bit from the pamphlets that we had, that talks about the what the commission does, but we just want to welcome him, and thank you for coming out here to talk to us. Thank you. Well, I have to say that uh, in my graduating class at the University of Connecticut, I was the only one who got an MBA in healthcare management, uh, which I thought was a little unusual. And then I began to think, I wonder if the other students uh, observed me and figured that it was probably a bad idea to get an MBA <laughs> in healthcare management. But it was, kind of, it was kind of funny to go to class because if I got there early and, and sat down, the students would come to me and say, hi, professor, my name is so-and-so. And yeah. Not the professor, and they go, who are you? <laughs> I'm one of the students. Uh, but Angela touched on a couple of things about uh, how bad health care is in the United States where, where it should be much, much better. And uh, just to give you a, a, a little bit of a slant on it, uh, in the seven years I've been commissioner, every single hospital in the greater Hartford area except the Hospital of Central Connecticut has been on probation and usually for things that are relatively egregious. Uh, and uh, it's, it's hard to sit back and think about that, that this is supposed to be, you know, the crown jewel of the medicine in our state, and we, we still have lots of problems with quality control and quality, and, and quality assurance. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a look at some of our st statistics, as Angela did, they're quite dismal. In Connecticut, black, African-American babies have three times the mortality of white babies have. And uh, that's bad. What's really bad is when you say, why is that? People go, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, maybe it's uh, multiple births. Well, people who have multiple births are, are usually not 18-year-old girls or 15-year-old girls are people taking fertility drugs. So if you take that population out, the disparity between African Americans and whites is huge. And we've never been able to get enough money to study it. However, I have a very bright, bright person in my department. And uh, she's studying it. We're going to compare two different census tracts. And we're going to figure out it's probably prenatal care uh, and, or, or uh, early postnatal care. And we, some, somewhere we got $30,000. Don't ask me. Because I, I, I haven't asked because I'm not, I don't want to know where it came from, <laughs> at least until after the administration changes. 
Our department is what is is big. We have about 800 employees, uh, but we're what you what business people call a horizontal conglomerate, and uh, the parts aren't interchangeable. We run a great big lab, and we're going to be uh, we're, it's going to be even bigger and better because we're building a hundred million dollar new laboratory uh, in Rocky Hill. And we do all kinds of different things, and. Uh, our problem, and I, for, as business guys, one, I want to tell you, here's our problem. We don't sell ourselves. We get one half of 1% of the state budget. And we don't sell ourselves very well. And people, when you say the state health department, people go, the state health department. Say, well, and you know what people think we do? Septic fields and restaurants and, and licenses. But mainly septic fields and restaurants. But we do a whole, whole lot more with the drinking water people and all that and we figured out how do, how do we market our department to a new co an incoming administration and uh, Lynn, Lynn Carol has put together a 10 minute now or yes. 10 minute presentation that'll show you show you what we're like and, and how we're organized and uh, Lynn is a recent graduate of Quinnipiac and did a great job on this so we're gonna we're gonna roll hopefully yes Public health is the science and practice of protecting and improving the health of a community through preventative medicine, health education, control of communicable diseases, application of sanitary measures, and monitoring environmental hazards. And since 1878, that's been the mission of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. DPH is Connecticut's public health and advocacy leader. The agency's authorities outlined in the Connecticut General Statutes, beginning with Chapter 368A, Section 19A-1A. We are the regulator of the state's approximately 229,000 licensed health-related practitioners and 4,700 daycare and youth camp providers. We collect and analyze information to monitor the health status of Connecticut's residents and, if needed, implement and oversee population-based interventions. We monitor infectious disease. We partner with local health departments to provide training, support, and technical assistance. We plan for a variety of public health imperatives and drill in the event of public health emergencies. We perform newborn screening blood tests on more than 40,000 babies born in Connecticut each year. All this and more on a total budget in fiscal year 2010 of $244 million, $136 million in federal funding, $84 million in state funding, and $24 million in additional funds. But the real backbone of the agency is our employees, who enable DPH to meet its statutory obligations. Many have advanced degrees and experience in specific concentrated fields like epidemiology, lab services, environmental health, public health, law, public administration, and business. Our highly specialized staff also includes over 100 public health nurses and four medical doctors. To achieve its mission, DPH is organizationally structured for efficiency and effectiveness. DPH has nine branches, each with a branch chief reporting directly to the Commissioner's Office. The Commissioner for the Connecticut Department of Public Health is the agency's Chief Executive Officer. He or she is appointed by the Governor, approved by the General Assembly, and must either be a medical doctor with a background in public health administration or hold a graduate degree in public health. The Commissioner possesses extensive statutory powers and duties regarding the health of the state's approximately 3.6 million residents. Among the Commissioner's mandates are facilitating the prevention and suppression of disease by adopting and enforcing the Public Health Code. To this end, the Commissioner may conduct hearings, issue subpoenas, administer oaths, and compel testimony. He or she assists and advises local directors of health in the performance of their duties. The Public Health Initiatives Branch promotes primary and preventative health care using a life course approach, monitors trends to improve the needs of the maternal and child health population, including oversight of the Federal Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, provides education to individuals and target population groups to make better choices in diet, exercise, and personal protective measures that enhance health, promote wellness, and reduce risk of injury and preventable disease, collects data to assess chronic and infectious disease and injury risk factors, and identifies and responds to emerging infections, conducts outbreak investigations and surveillance, including monitoring influenza and West Nile virus. 
The Public Health Laboratory supports the needs of all communities in the state, analyzing human clinical specimens and environmental samples submitted by federal and state agencies, local health departments, clinical labs, healthcare providers, utilities, and environmental engineering firms. The lab provides over 2 million test results on approximately 250,000 specimens and samples each year. Building has begun on a new public health lab located in Rocky Hill, which is expected to open in 2012. The Local Health Administration Branch is the primary interface and liaison between the department and Connecticut's local health departments and health districts. The branch advises the commissioner on the approval of appointments of local directors of health, administers per capita grants and aid for local health departments, and provides guidance to part-time health departments to move from part-time to full-time or to form or join other health districts. The branch also maintains and instructs public health partners in the health alert notification systems of broadcast fax, phone, email, and web EOC for emergency preparedness at the state and local levels. The Regulatory Services Branch consists of three sections, Environmental Health, which ensures the safety of the state's food supply, monitors beaches and swimming pools, and educates the public regarding the hazards of radon, asbestos, and lead. The Community-Based Regulation Section, which inspects and licenses the state's daycare facilities and youth camps and the Drinking Water Section, which inspects and tests all of Connecticut's public water supplies, as well as some private wells. The branch also has programs encompassing environmental and occupational health assessment and environmental practitioner licensure. The Healthcare Systems Branch regulates healthcare professionals and institutions, performs comprehensive background checks on certain healthcare workers, and investigates complaints against regulated entities. This branch has the statutory authority to investigate, prosecute, and take disciplinary action against healthcare providers who violate laws or regulations or otherwise pose a risk to public health and safety. The DPH Operations Branch administers and enforces emergency medical services statutes, regulations, programs, and policies, and designs and implements the agency's public health emergency and preparedness initiatives, including hospitals and the operation of the state-of-the-art 100-bed Ottilie W. Lundgren Mobile Field Hospital, which assembles in hours and can be ready to triage and treat hundreds of patients during any public health emergency, as well as the New England Disaster Training Center in Windsor Lock for training emergency personnel in disaster and emergency response. The Office of Healthcare Access oversees the state's healthcare delivery system to ensure that access to affordable quality care is available to the residents of the state. The office's major functions are administration of the Certificate of Need or CON program, statewide facility and service planning, healthcare data collection, analysis and reporting, and hospital financial review and reporting. OCA also partners with other entities on health care reform. The DPH Planning Branch is responsible for comprehensive health planning services, including the coordination of public health preparedness activities with local, state, and regional stakeholders. This branch also serves to provide data surveillance, assessment, analysis, and research, priority and policy development, and workforce development. The planning branch is home to the Connecticut Tumor Registry, the nation's oldest, as well as the state's Health Information Exchange Program. The administration branch provides agency-wide support services and ensures that business activities utilizing state, federal, and private funds are coordinated and accomplished in an effective and efficient manner. In addition, the branch is responsible for developing and implementing agency policies and procedures. Included within the branch are sections on human resources, equal employment opportunity, contracts and grants management, fiscal services, and the public health hearing section, which presides over hearings and renders decisions concerning certain disciplinary actions. In addition, DPH has offices that work cooperatively with and across all branches to support their various public health efforts, including the Communications Office, which directs a full range of communication activities including public information, freedom of information, media and community relations, and crisis communications. The Government Relations Office, which manages and develops the Department's regulatory revision and legislative programs, coordinates the development of the agency's regulations, and acts as the Commissioner's liaison to the General Assembly, Congressional Delegation, and both public and private sector organizations. 
the Office of Healthcare Reform, which oversees the planning and implementation of healthcare reform within state government and serves as the liaison between state and federal agencies and all external stakeholders, including insurers, providers, employers, and consumers. And the Office of Research and Development, which oversees the management of strategic priorities of the department, including programs for stem cell research and umbilical cord blood banking. Public health work in Connecticut has a huge impact. DPH strives each day to serve the residents of our state at levels well above expectations. We are people-focused and results-driven. In the 21st century landscape of public health, the DPH seizes opportunities and meets and exceeds challenges in order to do what we've done best for over 130 years, keeping Connecticut healthy. Now I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot compacted into 10 minutes, and um, I'll let the commissioner speak to the agency and the need for people like you to go into public health. <laughs> Well, wait, I'll just take a couple of minutes so my the rest of these folks can say what they what um, they need to say and, and give you their point of view. Um, we have, a, in a way, an aging workforce. Uh, many of our people, of all those hundred nurses, most of them have had at least 20 years of experience because they do inspection, uh, and we have problems with our workforce in that, uh, particularly for people who do laboratory medicine and types of things like that, it's not a wildly popular career because everybody thinks you have to have a doctorate. Uh, and the UConn has recently instituted a program to use, a, at least for the time being, to use a master's degree in science uh, as an endpoint of programs to produce people who work in the labs and, and do the kind of things that <clears throat> we need to do. Uh, <clears throat> we have we have a lot a lot to do, and we're we're busy with. And we do some interesting things at our disaster training center. We we're, uh, we're just we just opened it in April, and we've had our first class was the the uh, FEMA uh, sent us 350 people uh, before we had the, the place completely open. Uh, we're already booked for for six federal um, federally funded classes next next uh, spring and into the early next summer. All those things have business applications because the people come, they fly into Bradley Field. We're right across the street uh, from Bradley, right across Route 75. Uh, the business part ha uh, spills over into billeting these people in local motels and feeding them. Our that first group of 330 people, we think, put about $115,000 into the, into the Windsor, Lock, uh, Windsor Locks coffers, all of which was uh, paid or subsidized by the, fed by the federal government. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting place where we're going to get two, some of you may have read about the new M8 railroad cars that are going to replace the additional, the existing ones. We're going to get two of them and, and arrange them to be a, a training aid. One will be on its leaning on its side at about 45 degrees. The other one will be straight up so we can learn how to extricate people uh, from subway and train, and train actions. Uh, a lot of our people are very, very scientific. Uh, we have people who have degrees in, in pure statistics or in combinations like that, but we need people to manage. Sometimes the folks that, that are very scientific, they sort of lose sight of a little bit about, about you gotta find a way to pay for these things. And you gotta figure out how the whole, the whole thing is gonna work. We're currently uh, been asked uh, by an, an individual, uh, the Model Sporting Goods Stores uh, folks, uh, and they wanna put in additional tests, you know those 40,000 kids that we test every year, we do 30, over 35 tests, and they want to add a new test for multiple, uh, for, uh, multiple immune problems, and we're, we're trying to figure out how we get, how we get the money. So people, we, we need people who understand that, that uh, uh, you can't do this, the study that I mentioned early, earlier about why neon, black children have more perinatal mortality than white children, <clears throat> unless you got some money to pay for it. And, People have to figure that out, and they have to manage. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Guile, who's my deputy, uh, runs the Quality Assurance uh, Committee within the agency, and, and that's another function that we have to make sure that the product we put out for hospital or physician discipline or for questions is, is qualitatively sound. So lots of room in there for people who uh, want to manage health healthcare problems.
You're welcome. That was impressive. Should we probably jump? Do you want to make some? No, I'm going home now. Are you going home? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to bring your DVD. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gowan. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Mr. James Cullen. Mr. Cullen has been with Gaylord Hospital since 2001, serving as President and Chief Executive Officer. His experience in healthcare administration is extensive. Prior to joining Gaylord, Mr. Cullen was the President and Chief Executive Officer of St. Joseph Medical Center in Towson, Maryland. He has also held administrative positions in the St. Rayfield Healthcare System in New Haven for almost two decades, the last eight years as President and Chief Executive Officer. He is an advanced member of the Healthcare Financial Management Association and a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, serving on the Connecticut Board of Directors chapter. <coughs> Mr. Cullen has also been an active member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And there's more information in your program, for sure, if you'd like to read more. I am officially a fossil. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. And I do want to mention that this person to my left here is the president of our chapter, and she's very involved in ACHE. So fantastic that you have a student chapter going here, and so many of you are here tonight. Because I think when it comes to uh, what careers we want to be in, you know, education is obviously a lifelong laboratory. And for those who are in the administrative side of healthcare, the American College of Healthcare Executives is an organization that provides ongoing networking, professional education, and uh, mentoring, and you know, career search, and, and a lot of things. So when you're when you're done with your MBA, don't drop ACHE behind. Keep it keep keep it moving. So hopefully you weren't <coughs> going to talk about that. But if no, I if you job. were, I just I apologize. Uh, I'm a, a business person, obviously. I'm a CPA, and uh, I worked for a firm in those days known as Pete Marwick Mitchell and started three years after Medicare was enacted, and New York had a cost control law. So I have, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that trillions of dollars would be spent in the American healthcare system because everything was cost plus in those days. You spent a dollar, you filled out a cost report, and they paid you a dollar. So you were clearly incented to provide more services in newer buildings and be a participant in fueling the technological growth that has been the American healthcare system. It clearly uh, did not have the public health, if you will, flavor to it. And, and, uh, and that may be a contributing factor, you know, some 40 years later, uh, as to the challenges we have faced in matching up uh, public health metrics with the business of healthcare. But you've heard this phrase many times, probably 10 times today, it is what it is. And Angela said the healthcare reform bill is 2,200 pages long. Um, I would suggest that the Connecticut Department of Public Health is gonna be involved in a fair amount uh, of the implementation of the health reform law. So gonna, there's going to be more opportunity, I think, um, uh, in that regard. Um, but I went from public accounting and we, you know, I had a lot of hospitals as clients in both auditing and consulting and decided to get on the management side of things. And, uh, and so I took a job as a chief financial officer. And, uh, and then when I got to St. Raphael's uh, through the <coughs> tuition reimbursement program, that's what got me over to Yale. Um, so I was able to keep working while I got my master's degree, and then I was lucky enough to be able to teach a class for about five years after that. And, uh, and then with my jobs that Austin mentioned, I, I just couldn't squeeze out the, the one to three every Tuesday or Wednesday that I taught my class. But I found it very stimulating, and, and that's one of the great things about healthcare. I always say that healthcare and education are two laudable pursuits because you're always learning and you're always helping somebody else. And so even from my end of the, the world, in the business side of it, we still never forget that it's always about the patient. Uh, and, and that would be one piece of advice I would give you. It's always about the patient. Because if you forget that and lose your way, 
in the morass of regulations and business dealings and the like, um, it's just not as fulfilling and not as stimulating. The other thing I'd recommend is uh, take a class on negotiation because healthcare management is a constant negotiation process, whether it's within your organization or with payers or with the government uh, or with the DPH when they come to do their surveys. <laughs> There's always a negotiation. <laughs> and uh, ACHE happens to have a negotiation course. I'm sure it's, I forget, Austin and I were going over his curriculum this summer, but I, I forgot to look for that. But uh, I'm sure in the, in the law school there's got to be a negotiation course uh, if it's not in the MBA uh, healthcare management program. But that is really important, I think. Uh, I've never fancied myself a good negotiator, and I wish I had taken the ACHE course a lot earlier in my career than I did. The other thing that I would suggest uh, before you embark on your careers, if you're not there already, <clears throat> is learn a little bit more about servant leadership. Because as administrators, uh, while the organization chart may go this way, uh, and that is fun, I'm not going to lie to you, being the CEO, does, there's a lot of fun to it. Uh, you know, as people will say, it's good to be king, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, but it is fun because, you know, in, in working with other people and directing the activities of an organization, um, it, it, it's, it makes the day go by so quickly and it's so fulfilling. But we have to remember that we are servant leaders. Uh, again, for the patient and for the people that work at the bedside. Now, I happen to work at a specialty hospital, and coming to Gaylord was my first experience. And I work in what's called a long-term acute care hospital, and there's only about 400 of us in the United States of America. And they're not even that well geographically dispersed. There's a lot in Massachusetts, Louisiana, Texas, California. There's only two in the state of Connecticut, Gaylord and the Hospital for Special Care in New Britain. The veterans home in Rocky Hill is classified under Medicare as an LTAC, but they have a defined population that they serve. Um, so as a specialty provider, you are, uh, I don't want to say limited because that would be unfair, but we tend to be smaller. You know, our entire budget is about 70, 75 million dollars. The operating room at St. Rayfield's alone 15 years ago was 75 million dollars. Um, so when you look at job opportunities, certainly in systems like Yale and hospitals like Greenwich and with the state of Connecticut, the specialty hospital world is a little bit smaller, but I do think it's incredibly interesting because of what's coming with healthcare reform and uh, the whole idea of these accountable care organizations and bundling payments and what we always used to say was the right care in the right place at the right time there is uh, an essential need for specialized providers because we can get the patients out of the, uh, the uh, ICUs at the acute care hospitals where they've had their life saved and then we can help get them back to their lives. So I've been in the big organization, now I'm in a small organization. They both have very interesting dynamics. Um, so I would say don't, don't just look for a big organization and say I can move up the ladder. Uh, keep, be very open-minded about that because uh, there is a need throughout the healthcare system and uh, a, a very critical need, I think. And, and the last thing I'll say is, uh, and I'm probably not a good example of this because I have four children, four adult children, and three of them don't live in the state of Connecticut any longer. And when Dr. Galvin mentioned the aging of the population, I can tell you we're doing a uh, a little consultancy on the rehab side of our operation, uh, very acute care rehab services that we provide. And the, and maybe Austin can help me with this, the under 65 population <clears throat> is projected to grow less than 1.2% in the next five years in the state of Connecticut. The over 65 population is projected to grow 11.2% in the next five years. So unfortunately in Connecticut, we have a bit of an inverted economy right now. And we need younger people to stay here in Connecticut, or if you're coming from another state and you're here at Quinnipiac for graduate school, love it and stick around the state. 
because uh, there is going to be uh, clearly a shortage of younger people in the healthcare field, uh, and not just in the clinical side, in the administrative side. Um, and it's going to be dynamic. Um, there's only now on the acute care side, I think 31 acute care hospitals. It was probably 36 maybe 20 years ago. Um, and, and Connecticut is unusual in that you have hospitals like Hartford and Yale New Haven, which are two, I saw Dr. Jacobs in the, one of the pictures, are two level one trauma centers at Yale and, and Hartford. And those are, they have an average census. Yale is, I know Yale's by heart because they're our largest referral source. The other day their census was 960 patients. And then you might go out to Wyndham or over to New Milford or up to Charlotte Hungerford or Griffin or some of the smaller hospitals or Gaylord where we're 137 patients. Um, so you have these big tertiary care institutions, very complex business enterprises and social institutions to the smaller community. So there's a diversity. We haven't added any nursing home beds in the state in a while, but I think we still have a very robust nursing home population. And we have assisted living facilities and full-fledged retirement you know, aging in place. So there's a real, I think, diversity of op career opportunities in the state of Connecticut. So I sound like I'm working for the Chamber of Commerce, but it, it is an issue. I spent a few years in the state of Maryland, and uh, that is a completely different uh, dynamic. In, in the county of Baltimore, we probably had 16 hospitals just in the county of Baltimore. Uh, and you're talking Hopkins and the University of Maryland, et cetera. So Connecticut, I think, has some great opportunity for you. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully your career path will, will, you'll stay at least a little bit open-minded to sticking around the state of Connecticut uh, because there needs to be that. We just, how many CEOs, six? At CHA, mm -hmm. at the annual meeting, Dr. Galvin was there, Nancy was there. Uh, I think six CEOs retired. Yeah, or are uh, retiring. And there's more coming mm -hmm. uh, in the next couple of years. And uh, so there should be opportunity. I don't think you're going to see 20 more hospitals built unless DPH is doing it because we've got a, a major public health need. Uh, but generally, you're not going to see the capacity grow but there, there is some turnover and different skill sets too. Not just finance and administration like I'm in. Uh, planning, uh, uh, management, middle management levels. So that I still think there's a lot of opportunity. And it's going to be very interesting with health reform. So you'll see the, the health care system, or lack of a system as we might say, um, is, is going to have some, some interesting dynamics, clearly in the next 10 years, because a lot of provisions of the health reform law don't even take effect for another seven or eight years. Um, and uh, we also know there may be some changes to that health care reform law based on what happened on Tuesday. So it's, it's, it's an ecosystem all in of itself at 2,200 pages. Uh, but, uh, but you've chosen an exciting field to get educated in, and the need is tremendous. The need is tremendous, so and I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'll I'll hang around later and give you my two cents on just about anything. <laughs> yeah. Austin can tell you I don't lack an opinion on too many things, <laughs> and I have to point out Dr. Ed O'Connor because he's on our board, so he's one of my bosses. So uh, we, and we enjoy at Gaylord an absolutely phenomenal relationship with Quinnipiac, uh, and have for years and look forward to it. Uh, in the future, and uh, we're really, really uh, blessed to have that relationship. And Ron Rosette, who was the former yep, director Dr. Of this Ron program. Rosette, yeah, was uh, sure what back in the mid '90s was chief medical officer, and uh, I think Tracy's still over at our place. I haven't seen Tracy Wall lately. She's a faculty member in in uh, physical therapy. Ed, yeah. Ed is everyone's boss. <laughs> <laughs> Just about, I guess. That's what he told me. It's true. Thank you, Jim, You're welcome. for your excellent comments. Even Perhaps. without the DVD, Perhaps. it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make one for you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll take you up on that. I'll take you. Yeah. Yeah. Are you staying? We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Our PR department will greatly appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Collins.
Please join me in welcoming Nancy Rosenthal, who is the Senior Vice President of Health Systems Development at Greenwich Hospital and Vice President of, at Yale New Haven Health System. <coughs> Ms. Rosenthal joined the Greenwich Hospital Senior Management Team in 1990, and prior to which she, uh, or prior to Greenwich Hospital, uh, Ms. Rosenthal was the Vice President for Marketing and Business Development at Iowa Health System, and before that, a Senior Research Analyst at Market Opinion Research in Detroit, focusing on healthcare. Ms. Rosenthal is, the fellow, um, is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and has served as the regent and now as president, as mentioned, of the Connecticut chapter. She is also a board member of the Jewish Home for the Aged and serves, serves, as a number of, uh, serves on a number of other community and professional boards as well. And Ms. Rosenthal received her master's in public health from the University of Michigan. And that pretty much encompasses what's in the brochure, so you want to go back to that. <laughs> And I want to point out that I did work at the Detroit um, Health Department and at a community mental health uh, center Good. before Great. I went to a hospital. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I'm going to, my presentation is going to be uh, divided into a couple different segments. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career journey. And then I want to talk to you uh, just for a few minutes about what I see happening in healthcare today. And then just a few tips because I, because of my role with ACAG, I get contacted not only by students, but by a lot of adults, uh, either people who uh, are out of work or who are moving to the state and are looking for jobs. And I, so I give a lot of advice all the time. So I'm just going to give you some ideas and some thoughts I have because many of you soon will be on the job market. And um, you know, there's just things to keep in the back of your mind when you get to that point. Okay. Um, first of all, when I uh, went to undergraduate school, I was really focusing on becoming an educator. I thought I was going to become a PhD and become a researcher and teach at the college level. And after I graduated from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I took a break because I sort of had enough of school and I wanted to, you know, just take a few years to do some other things. And I was very fortunate to get a job as, at a um, university-based <coughs> think tank in my area of specialty. I had gotten an undergraduate degree in both um, social research, I mean social science, political science, and statistics. So working in a think tank really was up my alley. And after probably a few months of working there, I realized it was not my thing at all. I could not see myself doing research for the rest of my life because, as Jim said, I really wanted to be closer to seeing how I could make a difference in, in the world and you know, I wanted immediate results. I wanted immediate feedback in whatever profession I wanted to go in. So I realized I really wanted a professional degree, uh, whether it would be I ended up getting public health, but it could have been law, an MBA. It could have been any of the programs like that. But I decided a professional degree really fit me better than um, getting a, a, a PhD. And um, so uh, you know, I did. I spent you know a good part, portion of time looking to see what professional degree fit me the best. And that's how I settled on um, a, the School of Public Health, uh, getting an MPH. It fit my background. I had a social science degree already. I had a background in statistics. And public health definitely uses those skills. Plus, it added that human dimension, which I was really seeking at the time. Um, after I got my master's, I worked, as I said, in the Detroit Department of Public Health and at a community mental health center in Detroit. And then I got a job at a market research company, and I worked there for three years, and I eventually became um, in charge of their uh, health care division. But before I did that, I want to point out that in the 1980s, I helped redistrict Connecticut. I, I was in the political division of this market research company, and I helped the Democrats and the Republicans in Connecticut redraw their congressional lines. So I lived basically in the Capitol for almost a year. So this is all your well, then. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 1980s, that's why I pointed it out. <laughs> um, then um, after, you know, I was there for a couple years, and my clients, uh, I had a, you know, one of those incredible jobs where my learning curve was like this, very, very steep, but I was putting in like 80 hours a week of work. And my job involved <coughs> finding clients for this market research, um, you know, doing the market research, presenting the results, and most of my clients were uh, boards of directors or um, administration of hospitals. And this was in like the early 80s. And this is when marketing in hospitals was very, very new. It was very, you know, it was a novelty at that time. 
And, um, you know, I found that not having worked in a hospital was a real detriment for me because whereas in some industries that are very mature, getting the market research, you know, they just wanted the data. They didn't really want to know what to do with it. They didn't want the strategy behind it. But my clients really wanted expertise and wanted the strategy of what do I do with this data. So I decided it was really time for me to go and, and work in a hospital for a while and really understand the mechanics. And I was fortunate in that I uh, applied for and got a fellowship at Iowa Health Systems in Des Moines, Iowa for two years in the areas of planning and marketing. And when I finished that fellowship, they did offer me a job as a vice president. And I left there as, as a vice president um, of marketing. And I worked, it was a, it's a very large health system, it's statewide. Um, and you know, I worked on system development as well as at the large sort of uh, mothership hospital. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount. And then I moved to New Haven because of my husband. And I uh, took a job at Greenwich Hospital, which is you know peanuts next to Iowa, Iowa Methodist Medical Center where I worked. Uh, it's just a fraction of the size. But getting to Jim's point, and the reason I bring this up, is because um, in, in terms of where you work, there's any place you work has so, so many great opportunities to you. Working in a large medical center or an academic-based medical center has certain attributes, but I found my job was much narrower. I had a specific job and I was doing, I was down a certain path and um, while I was very high in the organization, I had very specific responsibilities. Working in a smaller hospital like Greenwich Hospital, I have so much more breadth of responsibility. I have a lot more uh, responsibilities than I did when I worked in a much larger center. So uh, maybe it's due to budget, maybe it's due to not being able to hire as many people to do the work, but I have grown just as much or more working in a smaller facility than I did at a larger one. So I, I'm just saying this because when I was younger, I used to think bigger is better, but that's not necessarily the case. So think about these kinds of things when you pursue your career. Um, in 1988, I believe, 1998, Greenwich Hospital became part of the Yale New Haven Health System. So I work you know, very closely with my colleagues about the Yale New Haven Hospital and Bridgeport Hospital. And again, that's been another growing experience for me. Now, some of the issues facing hospitals, and I have to put on my glasses because, because of healthcare reform, they are very new, so <laughs> um, I have to remind myself what they are. First of all, there are many issues that are still here, and they've been here for decades, and that means um, continuing lower rates of reimbursement from the federal and state programs and managed care uh, companies, capital needs to stay current in technology and infrastructure, the need for philanthropies to subsidize the cost of providing services, competition and so on. Those are the current uh, issues in place right now in, um, in most of the hospitals within the state. On the horizon are a set of new terms and acronyms, ACOs, PCMHs, EHRs or EMRs, and bundle payments. An ACO is what Jim referred to as an accountable care organization, and that's a combination of hospital, primary care, physicians, and possibly specialists with a defined population of patients and who are accountable for total Medicare spending and quality of care for that population that they're taking care of. Part of an ACO is a PCMH, or patient-centered medical home, which is a physician or group of primary care physicians that manage the population's health. And pilot studies nationally have shown that, um, that, at PC, that primary patient-centered medical homes have been an effective and efficient uh, in chronic disease management and they really have reduced the use of emergency rooms and hospital stays. Now, one component, component of delivering effective and efficient care is having an EHR or EMR, either an electronic health record or electronic medical record. They're used synonymously. And this allows all caregivers to speak to one another and share medical information about a single patient. Bundle payments, or one payment to be distributed among all, is a way the providers share the revenue and this is why efficiency and effective healthcare matter because all have a stake in the revenue stream. So um, you can see that you know there are a lot of new components that are entering into the whole healthcare arena. They are things that are, we're going to have to get used to over the next decade, as you mentioned. They're not going to ha happen tomorrow, but they are going to evolve. Um, even if we have uh, change, which we do have changes in uh, Congress next year. 
uh, health care reform is still going to happen. It's just a matter of some of the other changes that may take place as a result. Another big component of change that's occurred is what's happening to physicians. Um, reduced reimbursement, increased overhead, reduced salaries and standards of living are just some of the reasons why many physicians are truly angry members within our medical communities. You know, many of the physicians for many, many years dreamt of being their entrepreneurs, running their own practices, taking care of their patients wholly, being leaders of the community. They were compensated very well for it. But since then, I would say over the last 20 years or so, compensation has been re reduced dramatically. And the attractiveness of becoming a physician has greatly diminished. We, as patients, still expect the same quality, attention, and time from them. But it's, it's hard when you're not reimbursed for spending you know, an hour with a patient. It's very difficult for the physicians to, um, to do that for each of the patients. Uh, for some physicians, they're conducting more uh, tests in their offices, they're doing more procedures in their offices, they're joint venturing with hospitals or other entities to try to make up for the loss of revenue. But we're seeing more and more physicians <coughs> throwing in the towel, joining large medical groups, or becoming employed by hospitals. And I'm afraid that the era of you know, the solo family practitioner is coming to an end. I think we're going to see a shift in the type of doctors of the future. We're going to see less of the entrepreneurial types and more physicians who want to be employed and want regular hours. So that's, that's my little soapbox. Now, for those of you that are looking for um, you know, degree, looking for jobs in um, health care, here are some ideas that I have for you. First of all, network like crazy. When I first moved here, you know, even though I pr had a pretty decent career going, I didn't know anyone in the Northeast. And I really had to market myself like crazy. Um, and I spent a lot of time, I spent about four months just n marketing myself and networking with people and asking people to give me the names of other people I could meet. And I figured that the probability of all of that, being a statistician, would be that eventually something would come through for me. And it did. Um, networking, asking, talking to people on the phone, um, making some appointments with some key people and be strategic about who you make appointments with because it's your time and it's their time is very important. I, I found early on that people felt very that I could see their body language when I, you know, told them I was looking for a job. And after probably a couple of weeks of doing that, I, I backed off from that and decided that's not what I was going to do anymore. I, I would ask them if they knew of any other people, if they knew of any jobs out there, or if they knew any people I could further speak with, or if they had any projects that I could do, I could work on. And I found that um, people were just so helpful. They, they really, they felt less threatened by me being asking them for something, because I did have to ask them for something, and they were more willing to help. And very shortly, I had a bunch of projects I could work on. Now, it wasn't a full-time job, but it did lead into eventually getting a full-time job. And I have found that that strategy that I just explained to you has worked for many people over the years that I've, I've been here. Um, I also suggest that getting, a, getting an internship, whether it's paid or not, I mean, if you're in school, you're in school anyways. So, you know, ask if, if there's a place that you would like to work or a place similar to the type of place you want to end up working. Go in and offer yourself and say, you know, I'm willing to help you out on a project or whatever. Um, you know, it'd be great if I could get paid, but if I can't, I'm just looking for the experience. And you'll find people are generally very helpful. They do want to give kids and students a break. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's one of the other strategies I would take with you. Um, volunteer at an organization as well. Any management experience is a plus. I don't care if you're working at the Subway sandwich shop down the street. It shows that you can work with people, that you know how to manage people, and you can deal with problems or crises. There's a lot of attributes of management that are just common across any type of discipline. It doesn't really matter whether you're in the hospital setting. But to have it on your resume says that you have managed people and you have that experience and that's very important. Another item to include on your resume is any type of leadership experience. Any time you've taken the lead in, in anything, really, it shows that you're motivated, 
that you are you have some assertiveness, ambition within you, even if it's not related to your field of study. I saw a resume of someone who did something with Taekwondo. I mean, they were in healthcare, but they had they had taken some they had run some program, that's number one. Number two, they had won some uh, competitions. And you know, it said to me this person was focused. This person saw an end result, had a goal in mind, and they achieved it. And, and even though you might think it doesn't really matter, it's not related, it really, it really is. To someone like any three of us that look at resumes all the time, we notice those things. We really do. And we, won't, we don't expect people who are early in their career to have a full resume. We're looking for the promising people out there, the people that have the skills to go further. That's what we're looking for, the promise. And those are all things that you can include that will speak to us. Uh, get involved. I mean, right now you have a student chapter of ACHE here on campus. Um, I'm the president of the Connecticut Association of Healthcare Executives. That's a Connecticut chapter. We have a number of young people that have gotten involved. And I don't mean just attending networking sessions. We have a lot of those. But it's difficult when you're, everybody's networking. It's difficult to really get to know someone during those sessions. What's best is to join a committee. We have lots of committees. And that's when you really get to meet the people and get to know the people on the committees. And those are people like us. We have a lot of senior people in our chapter. We're very unusual across the country. Wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Jim's just yep, got all, I mean, he was on our board forever. We have a lot of senior people on our chapter. And uh, we all feel that part of our job as senior healthcare executives are to train and mentor younger people or people new in their careers. <coughs> it doesn't matter how old you are. When I say young, I mean new in your careers. Um, you know, it's part of our profession. It's part of what we're, we're fellows for in our profession. Uh, so, um, you know, get involved. The, CA, the American College of Healthcare Executives is a great organization. It's very inexpensive for students. And I believe you can still get the student rate even a year or two after you graduate um, and until you're well into your career. But getting involved in any of the, uh, the committees that we're involved in, you will meet people and you'll be able to have conversations with them. And they can serve as that jumping board to help give you other people to talk to and so forth. Your resume. I can't, you know, this sounds like so dumb that I'm gonna say this to you, but I can't stress it much as, as uh, enough. Make sure it's error free. <laughs> Your resume, people don't understand. You know, sometimes you'll be lazy and you'll think, oh, I don't really need to put that extra line in there. I have to tell you something. Your resume is totally a reflection of who you are. It tells whether you care about your parents. It tells whether you care about how you present yourself to other people. It should have no typos, no grammatical errors, and it should be nice. And I don't care if it's one or two pages, personally. What the content is what matters to me. I don't think it should be more than two pages, but I, you know, unless you are someone who publishes a lot and you have a lot of that extra information. But for someone who's just basically telling their education and their job history and their extracurricular activities and things like that, you know, I've heard so many people say, just keep it to a page. I don't really care. It's the content that matters. But to me, it should be error-free and spend time looking at that. Um, I also think it should be a fair reflection of who you are. I mean, if you're a good writer, all the mo more power to you, but it should be a fair and honest reflection of who you are. Because if you do get, a, if you do get a, an interview as a result of your resume, um, any one of us will be able to assess you right away, whether, you're re whether your resume is a reflection of yourself or not. And to me, you know, I prefer people who are honest about themselves and know themselves and are able to present that in their resume. Um, Personally, I look for a motivated person, someone who's involved, who has leadership attributes. Getting along with others and being likable is huge. It sounds so simple, but it's huge, especially in healthcare. It's a people job. It's all about relationships in healthcare. Whether you're, whether you're having a relationship with, with your staff, with physicians, with your board of trustees, with patients, with visitors, it's all about relationships. Um, I don't think Jim would ever have had his job at St. Rafe's or at Gaylord if he didn't get along with physicians, if he wasn't likable, if he didn't get along with the board. 
It is a very important attribute, and that's something I look for. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> well, that's so thank you for having me here today. So I appreciate it. Fun. You know, can I go back to the business for a minute? Sure. Yeah. Just tell you, I want to tie this into Tuesday, because when Nancy was talking about better, in 1994, the Republicans took the majority control of both houses of Congress for the first time since before World War II. And Newt Gingrich became the head of the Republican side, and he and President Clinton had to forge a partnership. And in 1998, I think it was, we saw the Balanced Budget Act. Mm -hmm. And that was done on the backs of the Medicare program. And as part of that, they had what's called the SGR, or sustainable growth rate. And just about two months ago, physicians took about a 20% hit in their reimbursement. And then I was looking at Ed O'Connor in the back of the room in Quinnipiac, beginning a medical school here in the next 24 months or so, um, and focusing on primary care. Today. Say what? New Dean started today. New Dean started today. Um, and you know, when you get to be my age, you have these flashbacks and you go, when Nancy said that, I said, you know, and you're going to see physicians, unfortunately, say, I'm not going to see Medicare patients at a time when we're trying to expand the availability of medical coverage to more people in this country. The, I don't know, it, you know, the, the, these things don't get aligned. And unfortunately, it is a big business, 17, 18 percent. But just listening, when you made that comment, uh, as people to be involved in healthcare as a career, and let's assume for the moment it's in the business side, um, that dynamic of dealing with people and negotiation that I said earlier um, is going to have to be very cleverly done because there is so much money involved in this, so much money. And if we're not going to lose sight of the patient, and you can see some of this being very well intended, emergency room visits are on the rise again. We thought 10, 15 years ago, you know, emergency rooms would start to slow down. But if there aren't enough primary care physicians and enough people involved, at the, and, and an emergency room visit today has got to be a couple hundred bucks, I would think, just to show up and get registered. Um, so n people being committed to trying to rationalize what the heck we're doing is going to be more important than ever. More important than ever. I yeah, just had to I share could, that I because could, it's a, yeah. I just sit there and I'm listening. My God, we just had this election two days yeah. ago, yeah. and it pushed me all the way back to the 90s well, let, and let the me balanced just, budget amendment. Just share a thought with you. Most, most hospitals operate, all hospitals, function because they have a, a combination of payors. They have private insured, <clears throat> and they have Medicare, and they have Medicaid. Okay, and so that's your, that's your base, kind of your, your, your starting point. And, you know, they, some, <clears throat> there are some special programs, but if you want to think about it easily, uh, you've got three classes of patients. Now, on the average, maybe you can break even on, on Medicare or make a couple of percentage points profits, but not a lot, not a lot. And you, you, you really go in negative on Medicaid because they only pay you, it, it can be as little as 68 or 70 percent on a dollar's worth of, I'm talking about on a dollar's worth of service, you get 68 cents back. And so <clears throat> what has to happen, and since you're all business students, you know about cost shifting. So you, what you do is you cost shift from the private insurers, and some of the private insurers pay up to a buck thirty-three or a buck thirty-five for a dollar's worth of service. So the way that you stay in operation is you shift, you shift uh, from the, the the folks who are really good payers to cover the, <coughs> the folks who are eh, payers, but also to cover the people who pay you considerably less than cost, and that's great. And so. <clears throat> I don't think my friend John Tobin would mind me saying this. Whatever a hospital operates that way, then they balance it, and, and it's okay, but it's only balanced as long as you don't change one of the three categories. 
So if all of a sudden uh, you get a big influx of Medicaid patients, you can't buffer the cost enough. If, if you're losing, if you're losing, let's just say for ease of, of uh, math that you can do in your head, if you're getting 70 cents on a dollar for a Medicaid, you got to get a buck 30. You have to have a private pay that'll give you a buck 30, so you can break even. But if you get a lot more Medicaids and you get a lot less of the private pays, then you got a real problem. Then you're going to go negative. Now, when you look at universal health insurance or the type of health insurance that's, that's proposed, that's going to insure a lot of people who right now have pretty good paying insurance. And, and if you think that a federally based insurance program is going to pay much more than Medicare, you're sadly mistaken. My guess would be to pay maybe a dollar five uh, versus a dollar three or a dollar two for a fraudinary Medicare. Now you got a problem because you're, you're shifting people from that high pay category into a break even plus category. But what about the people who, are, who can't pay at all? Uh, and if you haven't been in the country five years, you can't, you're not entitled to uh, federal programs. So somebody's going to have to figure out how do you make how do you make all this stuff work? Particularly, we I'm just wrote. They better figure it out. Yeah, we just wrote a paper for hospital economics uh, that says at least in Connecticut, it's going to cost you a lot more inc for incremental patients. That means for each patient that you add, it's going to cost you more than the last one. And so, need some good brains to figure that out. Absolutely. Questions, comments. Um, I'm in the graduate public relations program, and I'm taking a course now on issues in healthcare. It's part of uh, not our requirements, but the electives. Um, I was wondering if any of you can give any points on public relations in healthcare. Probably Lynn is the best person to talk about, <laughs> about that because she does that. Well, <coughs> at least on the the public health side, as Commissioner Galvin said earlier, we don't get ourselves out there enough. When public health is doing its job properly, you don't hear about the work that we're doing because we're preventing things from happening. Uh, so we need to sell to the media and expand to the social media end of the world uh, what it is that we do. But good news isn't always the news that sells. So we have to find a way to make it sexy, if you will. And it's pretty hard with some things. I mean, if, if uh, the sewer system's not working and you've got you know, stuff running down your street or in your cellar, that's going to make the news. But uh, talking about just going out and selling public health is very, very difficult. Um, but we do it and we do the best that we can on, I mean, we created this video basically just based on my time and we put it together. We, we sometimes have to take things out of uh, the resources that we have. Now, I may not be there in, in a couple of months because I'm an appointed official. So uh, you have to really look at creative ways of promoting, at least in the public health realm, of promoting who we are and what it is that we do. And hopefully this is a good start to, to being proactive about that. Every right. hospital has a PR department for sure. Yeah. Some are bigger than others. You know, the bigger hospitals tend to have the bigger departments. Some hospitals combine marketing with PR. Um, but, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's hard to do a true return on investment calculation because you're dealing with image. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with health reform and how that affects, you know, will more PR be done within these accountable care? You know, it's, again, it's, it's some aspects of this are a little, in, you know, hard to figure out right now. But I would, I, I can't, I can't imagine a hospital of any size in this state or any other state not having a PR department. And they often get involved in community relations too, by the way. Yeah. They do at Gaylord. As long as there's competition among, at least from the hospital point of view, I'm not talking about public health, but as long as there's competition, there's going to be a need for uh, <coughs> public relations. Because, you know, it's a big way of getting your name out there and promoting yourself. Now, there are a lot of regulations that hospitals have, such as laws that protect patients and their health information. HIPAA, and that's a big job of the public relations department as well is to you know protect the you know the caregivers and 
and the patients. Um, you know, another big component is, as, as, and, and as part of getting your name out, is there's so many different types of media networks that are available today. Like, a lot of the newspapers are dying, and social media is becoming bigger and bigger, and there are less restraints on um, the use of social media. People can say anything out there. So, you know, really, you have to be really smart in public relations to really manage your organization's information and communication vehicles. Uh, yeah, we've started up, a, uh, we have a Facebook group on our, off of our website. Mm -hmm. So we have six, you know, I wouldn't have thought of this six months ago, 60 people want to be networked to Gaylord on an ongoing basis. <laughs> you just don't think of it that way. We put, we put our Halloween parade up there, the other five people. <laughs> Facebook back, oh, what a cool parade. And I'm like, I am so far gone from all of this. <laughs> Under, understanding how people talk to each other in this environment is very important. And, and here's your day for responding to Facebook. And just to follow up on uh, what Nancy said, there are going to be opportunities for public relations and education for EMRs, the electronic medical records, for HIE, the health information exchange, the insurance exchanges, and, and just about every aspect of healthcare reform. So I think there is a lot out there for somebody who's educated in public relations and education. Well, and also, you know, if you're not for profit, uh, the, the Congress. Is, uh, is always looking at people justifying their not-for-profit status. And they have what are called social accountability <coughs> guidelines and rules. And that has to be included in your annual submission at both the state level and the federal level. And that usually mm -hmm. befalls to yes. the public relations exactly. department mm -hmm. to put that together. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned community relations. It's all part of you know, that. Yeah. You have to, you, you know, as part of the health reform law, the short-term hospitals are all going to have to be involved in developing a community health plan. And a lot of times the PR folks are looped into that. Mm -hmm. You know, grant requests. I mean, we, you know, so there's definitely uh, PR touches a lot of different things, at least within, within the hospital side, uh, for sure. The Connecticut Hospital Association has a group of public relations people that meet there. So you may want to start doing what Nancy suggested. Networking and information interviews. Thank you. Question, Larry. Uh, hi, Larry. Larry Katz. Your father was posing as your. Yes. <laughs> so, so here, Larry Katz uh, just uh, completed the uh, graduate certificate in healthcare compliance. And uh, I'm curious your perspectives on uh, compliance issues with <laughs> healthcare reform on our doorstep. You shut the uh, TV off there. Yeah. <laughs> You ask that question to Dr. Cal. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> we have, uh, just so you know, we have a whole developed healthcare mm -hmm. compliance certificate program here. Yeah, Austin and I think we're chatting about that yes. this summer. And our students are getting jobs as soon as they graduate from that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, in the, again, in the hospital, I happen to chair our compliance committee at the hospital. It's an administrative committee for us. We do have the vice chair of the board who happens to chair the audit committee, who serves on it. Um, but yes, uh, compliance, uh, our compliance officer who wears three hats, just came back from a conference in Baltimore. And you know, it's full of lawyers, whether they're private or government, and uh, you get sufficiently scared. Um, so it's getting to be a bigger and bigger part of it. Unfortunately, uh, compliance is an overhead department. So, you know, everybody pushes back about it because it's adding more to what people aren't going to pay for. But between HIPAA and, you know, with electronic medical records, it's, I would say, it's growing. We just had our compliance meeting Monday afternoon. I think we had 15 items on the agenda. Um, so it's growing exponentially. I don't think there's any, any two ways about it, you know, from as little as conflict of interest questionnaires mm -hmm. all the way up to, you know, privacy breaches and business associate agreements and all that. So it is. It's a burgeoning field. There's no, and, and the feds are, are hiring a lot more lawyers. Deeply embedded uh, in health care reform is a lot of money allocated to fraud and abuse issues, sure. specifically I mean, expanding the scope of yep. the False Claims Act. So I mean, they, th they throw the 20 to 30 percent waste and fraud around, mm -hmm. you know, like it's this bottle of water. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I still have never seen anybody prove that 20 or 30 percent, but it's clearly in something that spends 
the trillions of dollars we do, it's significant. And, uh, you know, the False Claims Act, and I kick back legislation that get that go back a ways. And, uh, and quite honestly, it's, it's an economic driver mm -hmm. for both the IRS and t it will help pay for some of these mandates within, within the health care reform. Right, the federal government sees it as a major source of revenue. I just, we need fair and balanced. I don't mean Fox TV. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, let's look at intent versus, I mean, sometimes it's so complex when you're trying to do the right thing. And you, you just hope that people don't just say, gotcha. Um, and, and, you know, I think if people are reasonable about it, but yeah, I, I would guess there's going to be plenty of jobs, uh, without a doubt, in the compliance area. Yeah, in Yale New Haven Health System, it, it is a committee that reports to our uh, individual hospitals uh, board finance committee that reports to the full board. So it's, you know, it's very embedded in our organizations and it's at a very high level. Mm -hmm. Oh, it has to be. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, Mr. Collin or Ms. Rosenthal would like to comment on the pros and cons of the EHRs, both from a utilitarian, good for the patient system in addition to revenue recovery? Hmm. You can go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, as far as for the patient, it is, it, it is the best thing available for the patient because all the patient's information, if, if everybody's leaked up to the EMR, of course, all the, all the patient's caregivers, um, you know, you have all the tests, all the results, all the notes available in one depository and all the caregivers can look at it. It reduces duplicated tests, it reduces the, um, uh, you know, the need for maybe additional physician visits, th things like that. So it, it can reduce costs. Um, you know, I will tell you that about two years ago I did a large study to see what people thought of Yale New Haven Health System, what they thought of when they thought of a system. And the first thing that came to their mind is that they could all talk to each other. All the hospitals and all the doctors were able to talk to each other. And you know, of course we couldn't. Now we're, we are beginning to Im, uh, implement, by the way, a, an EMR right, you know, as we speak, across all three hospitals and, and our community physicians as well. And so, you know, that means if there's a patient that goes to Greenwich Hospital and they need to be transferred up to Yale New Haven, the doctors at Yale will be able to look at that medical record and see what went on, when certain tests were uh, delivered, what the results were. It saves time, it's much more efficient, it's, and it's much more cost effective. I, I truly feel it's incredibly important. The downside is, it is so expensive. It is incredibly expensive. Um, you know, multi-millions, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars for a healthcare system to implement an EMR across sure. all of their hospitals. And plus, if you're partnering in the, the bundled world, mm -hmm. and since I'm in the post-acute side, uh, we've, we've, been, uh, we've had an EMR since 2003, and uh, I can guarantee you we're not going to connect fully with a Yale New Haven. Now, we can talk about uh, patients for referral, but in terms of getting in, if a Yale doc wants to see how their patient's doing at Gaylord, they have to come into our system to do it. They don't get to it through the Yale system. Now, eventually, you would hope that there's a portal there that would, like you can portal to a lot of other systems, but how that gets done and who's funding it, uh, long-term acute care hospitals were kept out of the uh, EMR money for health reform and the economic stimulus yeah, package. Why don't you explain that? Because it is being. Um, oh yes, in the in the there's money in both the economic stimulus package and in health reform, uh, and and actually Senator Elect Blumenthal's brother is the guy in charge of all this for the feds, and uh, their goal is to get an EMR for everyone. Now, um, I think that's a laudable pursuit. It, when the rubber hits the road is when there's always the challenges and uh, uh, how that gets executed is, is where everybody is is interested in, in seeing what happens uh, but it is expensive I think physician, our IT department is like yeah. seven eight people yeah. that's it it's hugely expensive but yeah. physicians and hospitals can get money back if 
they meet the um, EMR goals by a certain yep. date. And there's like a five year, or four yeah, year period. Yeah, there's a bus term for it now, right? I'm sorry. Meaningful, Meaningful use. use. Thank you. Right. <laughs> do um, the commissioner or Lynn, do you want to comment? I think it would be interesting for the students mm. to know what's going on at a statewide level. Both of you have really worked very hard at pulling together yeah, the group. Uh, That's right. a statewide initiative in this area. And maybe if you want to comment on that, if you. Well, let, let me let me let me. Uh, say a couple of, of, of things peripherally, and then uh, Lynn has had a lot of that responsibility, but for the average guy, and, and I, I think it was Jim who said it earlier, uh, but most of the practices in Connecticut are small. I think over 80% of them are onesies and twosies. So single, single practitioner, two people, occasionally three, and then there's some groups. But, but still, the, the majority of, of physicians who practice in the state practice in, in you know one or two, and uh, there's a pediatrician who lives right down the street from me, and and the whole thing just is kind of driving them crazy. I live in Glastonbury about uh, getting electronic medical records. It's probably going to cost him twenty five thousand dollars to 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 get us equipment and get hooked up. And to a guy in, in primary care, you know, we had some talk earlier about primary care, people don't want to do it. You know, if you're a primary care guy, which is general internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics, uh, if you're making a buck and a quarter, $125,000 a year after you sneak a little money here and do all the finagling, you're doing pretty well. And, and so somebody says, okay, now you've got to add a $25,000 $25, system. And they're, they're, people are very afraid of that. They're afraid, two things that really bother them, the money, you know, there's some ways you can work around the money. And, you know, I try to, try to tell them that, you know, you can amortize this over a number of years and take it as a as a deduction and blah, 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 blah. And they're still afraid of it. They're afraid they're gonna buy the wrong stuff. Right. And at the end of, and, uh, and I got, I used computers early for billing way back in the, in the uh, late late 70s, early 80s, and we got some, they weren't, they were kind of home-built programs, and there weren't any really good definitive programs, and I got some of the wrong stuff. And uh, when you get the wrong stuff, or something that's cobbed together, you know, only Lucky Eddie, the guy who's your computer guy, you know, the twitchy guy who comes in and talks to the computer, he's the only guy who knows how to fix your computer. And so you go in there one morning and your computer says, uh, you say, hi, and it says, uh, hi, I'm not working today, I'm sorry. And you go, what do you mean you're not working? I got 10, 15 patients coming between now and 2 o'clock, and the computer says, you're out of luck, buddy. And so you, you call Lucky Eddie or Twitchy Eddie, and you can't find him, or he doesn't have time for you. And so that's what people are afraid of. They'll get the wrong stuff, and they won't be able, they'll get dependent on it, and they won't be able to get service. <coughs> so part of public relations is to tell people, you're not going to get the wrong stuff. Uh, and whoever services your stuff will have service guarantees. As we all know, most of the time uh, when your computer doesn't work it's because you kicked the plug out or, or somebody did something to it and, and, and all you gotta do is, is reboot it. You know, 90% of the time you call a guy up and he says, have you tried rebooting it? And he goes, oh, well, yeah. And uh, you reboot it and it goes back on again. Uh, the feds are funny about this because the, what they say to us is, you know, Here's the bottom line, and uh, uh, we don't really care much about Connecticut or any place else. We see you and Iowa and uh, uh, South Dakota as nodes, and and so all we want, we don't care. To us, you look like one big node, three and a half million people, one node. All we want from you is to be able to get the information we need out, and for you to get the information you need back in. How you do that is your own business. And uh, one of our fears here is that since we're so small and we're sandwiched in by two bigger states, are the feds gonna say to us someday, the hell with it, why don't you just get, get, on, get become part of Massachusetts programs, a sub-node of Massachusetts or New York, or if you're east of the Connecticut River, Massachusetts, if you're west, New York. Uh, the network is gr in Connecticut is is growing, but it, it's there is there are already large, powerful players, some of whom don't like each other terribly well, and uh, Lynn can tell you a little bit more about 
the, the scenario? Well, this, the scenario basically, and this is kind of going back to the EMR, once the physicians have EMR and they're uh, needing to exchange with other physicians or with hospitals, it's great that Greenwich and Bridgeport and Yale can all talk to each other, but Greenwich and Bridgeport and Yale are going to have to start talking to Hartford, St. Francis, and Hospital for, of Central Connecticut. And it's the job of the State Department of Public Health right now to take $7.29 million that's been provided by the Office of the National Coordinator, which Angela mentioned is headed by David Blumenthal, uh, our Senator-elect's brother, um, to start building that system to look, do an environmental scan, see what's already out there, and figure out how we can implement a health information exchange so that Yale you know, can start talking to Hartford and can start talking not only to Hartford but can talk to Iowa or California uh, because this is intended to be a national system with national standards and national certification for health information exchange um, in, in EMRs. Now the little uh, caveat I add to that is that the legislature last year decided and the governor uh, signed into law the fact that we're going to have a separate quasi-public agency to deal with uh, health information exchange. It's going to be here for a long time. Like electricity, uh, it's looked at as a utility in many ways. So the uh, legislature and the governor put together legislation, Public Act 117, 10 117 if you're really curious, um, that sets up the board of directors for this quasi-public agency. Commissioner Galvin, by uh, title, is the chair. Whoever's the DPH commissioner is the chair. Angela has uh, been appointed to this uh, board of directors as well, and it will be their job to set up the health information exchange so that all the hospitals in Connecticut can talk to one another, and then we can be that node to get that information to uh, the national system. So God forbid I'm in California, I have a car accident, I'm in an emergency room, I can't speak. The doctors there can go to their health information exchange, which hooks into the national exchange, which says, okay, here is Lynn Townsend. These are the medications she's on. She had an x-ray last uh, fall for this, and they know, uh, you know, just about everything about my medical history, all the surgeries I've had, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the ultimate goal with health information exchange. How it will feed into and play into the patients, which I think was your initial question, uh, I found it, because my physician's already with health information exchange, or already with EMR, I found it to be wonderful, if just for getting the prescription from the office down the street to the stop and shop, it just goes electronically now, and I find that to be incredibly convenient, and I think there will be other little things that uh, the patients will notice, but for the most part, but I look for them, uh, I think for the most part it's uh, fairly invisible to the patient, and I think that at some point it is required that we'll be able as patients to have access to our own medical records, which I think gives control uh, to the person who really needs it, and that's to the patient themselves. The, the one fact that, or uh, fact subset that I can give you is pro-health is the largest primary care group in Connecticut. They have something like 220 primary care providers. Uh, and their president, uh, who's a good friend of mine, uh, said that uh, they offer all new, uh, newly employed physicians or APRNs, they give them the, uh, the electronic medical record program, and it pays for itself in 24 months. I think at, at this point, I'm going to ask our speakers if they just want to leave a thought with our students, and I'm just going to go through each of the things that I pulled from your presentations in just a second. So Nancy, do you want to start us off just? Okay. Um, well, we've talked about a lot of things tonight. I think probably the most relevant to you is something that Jim said, and that is that the population is aging, including the employed population in the state. And at least within the hospital community, um, I know a lot of people that have been in their jobs for a long time, and there will be a lot of turnover in the next 10 years. So I do think this is a great time if you are planning to be in health hospital administration and, you, and you're interested in staying in Connecticut, 
this is a great time to be in the state because I think there will be a lot of opportunity in the next 10 years within the state. And Nancy, I would like to thank you for your wonderful comments and your practical advice because of a lot of what you say, I say. Oh, okay, and <laughs> what I repeat over and over is healthcare is very incestuous and especially in Connecticut. And the way you started your comment off in terms of network, 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 I don't think you can do enough of that uh, because everybody knows everybody in the state. So once again, thank you for your incredible contributions to this program. It's much appreciated. Jim, do you want to? Well, you know, as I say, there's, there should be tremendous opportunity, but should be in get it, making it happen, you're right, there has to be that linkage. And don't forget negotiation course, never forget the patient, and don't forget a little bit about servant leadership, because we are there always to serve other people. That has to be the bottom line of the self-fulfillment of all this. And if, if you take that approach, I think you'll find it personally as well as professionally rewarding. You really would. And we need smart people. And Jim, thank, thank you sure. for your yep. really cogent, happy to, happy practical advice. Thank you for mentoring and being a mentor for our students. And hopefully we can make that a regular basis. And I just want to. I won't commit the to three that three nuggets yet. I pulled from here. <laughs> <laughs> three nuggets, but one I heard from John Thompson was always remember the patient and I just want to say that again. I try to end each of my classes that way and uh, it really is about the patient. You know, we may have training in finance, management, HR, but it really comes down to why are we doing this? Absolutely. So thank you for that sure. excellent advice and thank you for your time and expertise. Uh, happy to be here. It's our pleasure. And this is a great university. It, it really is. Really. And it's getting better and better. Yep. Commissioner Galvin. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't be a, a, a good family doctor if I didn't uh, tell you about my experience with uh, negotiations. And we had a, I don't know if you guys have ever done the pheasant egg negotiation. It's very, it's very interesting because uh, you're, you're the guy who has cornered the market on pheasant eggs. And pheasant eggs are used for several, they're used for research purposes, they're used for people to raise game, game birds, and they're used for food. And so there's a, there's a market for it, and uh, you're the guy who corners the market, but you got to sell them all within about 10 days, or they get rotten. And and so you had this, I had this group of people, and I was trying to bid up the price uh, per egg, uh, and uh, uh, they all had various reasons and, they, and various strategies. One wanted them for a group of, of hunting camps, and one wanted them for a group of restaurants, and it went on and on. And uh, um, all of all of a sudden, two people went out and, and at one of the breaks, and they were you know you could go out and make it, make agreements with other people to to get all the eggs that you needed, and both of these people needed uh, to get all the eggs or almost all the eggs uh, for uh, for research purposes, but they were negotiating together and they beat everybody out, and they got the I got the price up very nicely, but I couldn't figure out what they were going to do because they were like. 100,000 eggs and they needed 95 or 90 <coughs> each. And here's the point, you never know what the other guy is thinking. And you know what they were thinking, what the thing was, one of them wanted the yolks and the other one wanted the whites. And I had never even considered that. So they were perfectly happy and uh, they got 100,000 eggs which, which meant 100,000 yolks and 100,000 whites. But, uh, the negotiation is really important, and you, you, uh, you practice that, you realize the guy on the other side of the table, you really don't know where they're coming from. And, uh, but th that's a great skill to develop, and I know this is a great place, a great school to develop that guy's skill. Well, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Lynn. I, in all honesty, that video was terrific. I've been in healthcare for 25 years, and it really <coughs> framed everything that goes on at the Department of Health and thank you for all your contributions to the state and your tenure as commissioner. It's much appreciated and much appreciated that you're here tonight. So, and thank you to my very good looking, well-dressed group <laughs> of graduate students who just did a tremendous job tonight. So 